I am so happy to be here today. It's such a privilege to be part of this quite extraordinary convocation of people. Um, all of you leaders from around the globe, and all of you, to border, borrow Peter's phrase, um, determined to make a meaningful dent in the universe. Uh, so we are excited and pleased to be part of that. I am joined tonight by my son, Johnny, who's here with me. In addition to Johnny's contributions to the McNulty Prize, he's also a writer and performer of comedy back in the magical kingdom of Brooklyn. <laughs> and my daughter, Bryn, and son, Kevin, are both in New York and really, believe me, dearly wish they were here. They'd much rather be in Aspen. So I'd like to th also thank all of you who helped support this whole process of the McNulty Prize, um, Peter and Abigail, Margot Pritzer, Bill Mayer, Bob Steele, and of course, Walter and everyone with the Aspen Institute. So as many of you know, my children and I created the McNulty Prize in honor of my husband, who was a trustee of the Aspen Institute, and of course, in whose honor this room is named. So one of my guests tonight kid and said he was honored he was invited by Ann McNulty to come to the McNulty Room for the McNulty Prize. <laughs> so, I said, yes. Now, several people who are here as my guests tonight knew John. And all of us who knew John remember him in our own way. But creating this prize has allowed us to remember him in a different way and to tell the world about him. He would have loved the action forum. Uh, his own intensity was like an unspoken call to action uh, to break barriers, to engage deeply, and importantly, not to waste time. Now, John was the first of five children of two very determined Irish immigrants who came to Brooklyn uh, from Donegal, Ireland, seeking, as all immigrants do, a better life. Now, neither of his parents had much education. His dad was a landscaper, and his mom, incredibly enough, her first job in America was as a housekeeper for a Wall Street banker. So all of that made John's path to Wall Street and his ultimate success there all the more amazing. And certainly when I met him in high school, I wouldn't have guessed that either. <laughs> but John was both humbled and delighted by his luck. You know, for him to be able to look out from his high office downtown, looking out on the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor, and looking across to Ellis Island, where his parents had come not that many years earlier. So John had a big personality. Those of you who know him know this is true. He was an energetic, exciting, and occasionally irascible and irritating force of nature. <laughs> and throughout his life, he looked for opportunities uh, and sought to see, solve problems. In his business career, uh, in his hobbies, which included hiking and biking with his children out here in Aspen, and in the hands-on charitable work that he did. He really rejoiced in helping others grow, helping others learn, helping others succeed. And because of his own success, he was very passionate about giving back. So that's why in the process we have, the very difficult process of selecting finalists, we really look at creativity, we look at impact, we look at taking risks, we look at scalability, and we look at sustainability of the projects. But after we do all this detailed analysis of all the projects, we step back and are genuinely amazed, astounded, and impressed by all of you. So creating this prize has been a uniquely gratifying experience for us, for me, for Johnny, for Bryn, for Kevin, and a process that gets richer every year. We have all really enjoyed getting to know many of you through this process. So now we are ready to show you this year's finalists, so we'll cue the video. Just about everybody I mentioned this to thought I was crazy. I 
I think each of us in our lives, we want to feel like we have done something that has made a difference. Succeeding in our individual careers is just not enough. At the end of it, we want to feel that something we did was bigger than ourselves. I feel guilty all the week in 20 years of working that I was not doing enough to pay back. It should feel as morally reprehensible as slavery to imagine that we have an entire class of kids that doesn't get the same opportunity. I began to look up on the world and say, well, the clock is ticking. This thing you've always wanted to be in Nigeria, if you don't act now, it will be too late. I saw an incredible opportunity, hundreds of millions of people around the world who didn't have access to eye care, and I knew my particular skill set could make a huge difference in people's lives. Our fellows have been very successful in their business careers or other careers they've chosen, and yet they make a conscious decision to do something more. The McNulty Prize winners are really the best of the best and such unique and inspiring individuals. Well, I have to tell you, that was wonderful. That must be the most enthusiastic reception we've had from one of our films, which is very, very gratifying, because all of you get it. All of you know about it. Uh, I should have also introduced the Prolage, who's the director of our foundation and runs the McNulty Prize, and also works on the film. So we are very lucky that we have three of our four finalists here tonight. And in a moment, they will tell you briefly about what they are tackling. Uh, Chinwei is not here, but will join us by video magic. Um, but first, I am very pleased to invite to the stage a very special guest, 
Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. So, all of you know what a powerful diplomat she has been, what a talented writer, and what a compelling advocate for women. But what you don't know is what a convincing Antigone she was. <laughs> yes, in fact, several years back, our then chair of the Aspen Institute, Leonard Lauder, persuaded, cajoled, and ultimately forced those of us trustees who had not been to the Aspen seminar to attend. So Bill, Bill Mayer and Bill Nitzer, who's here today, were also in our group. So showing the wisdom of our group, of course, we nominated Madeline as Antigone. But to my good fortune, I got to play as many, her sister. And like all of you who have done the seminar, we thought that our version, which was a musical interpretation of Tibet versus China, we thought that we had the most brilliantly staged of Antigone ever. Uh, but most importantly, from my perspective, it gave me the chance to get to know and Madeline much better. And to this day, when she has a new book, she autographs it to me as to her sister. <laughs> and when she autographs books for my real sisters, she signs best wishes from Anne's other sister. <laughs> so to my sister from Antigone, Madeline, thank you. Thank you, Esmini. Um, <laughs> let me say, I, I, I have to say this. We actually did the musical version, and it was the summer that the Dalai Lama was here, and we had done Tibet, and so we sang, Hello, Dolly. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a good time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I am delighted to be here, and so delighted to have anything to do with the McNulty Prize, because Anne and I have gotten to be very, very good friends in so many ways, and I'm so admiring of what she has done in honor of her husband, John, uh, who was a remarkable figure and who really uh, made a huge difference for an awful lot of people, and therefore having this prize in his honor is so appropriate. I have a very difficult job coming up because I am one of the judges for the next set of McNulty Prize winners. And, and I think of various difficult things I've done. This is right up there. Uh, because, in fact, there are such remarkable people that are candidates for um, the, the prize this year, as there have been in past years. And I have been a judge every single year, except the first year when Jordan Caslow won. And it's a lucky thing I wasn't, because I would have had to have recused myself, because he's my eye doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he really led the way uh, by having a really remarkable project. And I think the thing that makes this prize so special is that the people that have come forward as the finalists, and, and I have to say, I hope as we recognize the finalists tonight, people understand it is a big deal to become a finalist. Because in fact, there are more and more terrific people that come out of our various leadership groups and from the outside that present fabulous projects. And I, I don't, I, and I know, we sit there, it's not easy. Alara, we do this together, and uh, it, is, it is a difficult job because the, uh, the projects are so amazing, and what we do look for are really projects that will make a difference, that are scalable, that we can track what is going on, um, and make a difference not only to the people who win them, but especially for those uh, for whom the project is designed. And Della, you have been just an amazing recipient, and uh, a and very brave in addition to being very smart and talented. So I am delighted, and thank you very, very much. And we will now hear from the finalists, but um, I just want to say how proud I am to be a part of the McNulty Prize team, and also then to be a part of Aspen. I'm a very proud member of the Aspen Institute Board. Um, I think this forum is a remarkable uh, 
innovation, I think, in developing what I can tell you makes a difference, a network of active and smart and new and young leaders because the world is a mess. That is a diplomatic term of art. And, and we need all of you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Nowhere in the United States is poverty more persistent or more debilitating than in Mississippi and the surrounding Mid-South states. It's not a coincidence that it also has the highest concentration of petty lenders, subprime loans, and people outside the banking system. These problems affect everyone, but no one more than the region's black residents. Mississippi has the highest percentage of black residents in the nation, and 49% of all kids live in poverty. At Hope, we're working aggressively to bring affordable and responsible financial services to these bank deserts. Since <clears throat> Hurricane Katrina, Hope has grown from $4 million and 4,000 members to $170 million and 28,000 member owners. Forty percent of these were previously unbanked. My action pledge is by 2016, through the innovative use of technology and non-traditional branch models, is to double the number of people and places we serve in the Mid-South. Thank you. My name is Manoj, and I'm from the India Leadership Initiative. So I had chosen this project in an area, area called Araku, which is a place fully inhabited by people who are not only indigenous, but the entire population live on less than $1 a day income. And what was more shocking is that these are all smallholder farmers, and 90% of the world's malnourished kids are parents, have parents who are smallholder farmers. So for me, the challenge was to see, can I unite these people using a large-scale agriculture with value addition as a project, and we spoke, we chose coffee to do this, aggregated the farmers into a large cooperative. Now it's the largest cooperative with 100,000 members in it. And they have grown coffee. We processed it in the region, export it as a single origin specialty coffee, and now they, most of them are out of poverty. This is sold as one of the finest coffees in the world with the name Araku, which is a, which is a, a tribute to the region. And now we are moving on to other products, including mangoes and various other fruits with these farmers being owners of the company. I'm Adam Lowry. I'm the co-founder of Method Products. There is no more visible nor striking reminder of our wasteful economies than the billions of tons of plastics that are floating in our oceans. The irony of the ocean plastic problem is that the solution already exists. It's simply reusing the plastic that's already on the planet. What we lack is a solution for the apathy <clears throat> of people's attitudes towards plastic and the imagination to do something about this problem and the toxicity that it causes. By doing what was said to be impossible, Method is demonstrating that individual action can have a positive global impact. The solution to the ocean plastic problem is not making bottles out of ocean trash. But by doing so, we're showing that there's no excuse to not use all of the perfectly good plastic in the world that doesn't get recycled. If we do that, we turn off the tap of plastics flowing into our oceans in the first place, and we take the first, most important step towards solving the, o the ocean plastic problem. This project is self-sustaining today and growing rapidly. It's a project that has a far more profound and lasting impact than merely the plastic we're taking out of the oceans because we're changing people's minds about their relationship to the things that they surround themselves with in their daily lives. Hi, my name is Chinwe Onyagoro. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fundwell. Fundwell was created because the trillion dollar U.S. small business credit marketplace is fundamentally broken. 
and 27 million small businesses bear the brunt of this harsh reality. Seven out of every 10 small businesses that makes less than a million dollars in revenue and applies for a loan gets rejected, and they don't know what to do next. Those few that do get approved often have to take high interest rate payday loans, even when they qualify for more affordable financing. And the banks, who are the largest capital sources in this marketplace, by far don't have the mandate, the infrastructure, or the enlightened self-interest to do anything about this problem. Fundwell is an online platform that provides quality lender referrals and financial health recommendations. We're focused on unlocking the potential of the credit markets for small businesses that are qualified for good money. And for those that are not yet qualified, we provide a roadmap to better financial health. Thank you. Hello, I'm Johnny McNulty. I'm pleased now to introduce our tradition of presenting a medal to each of the finalists, presented by Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Although she cannot join us tonight, we are pleased to recognize the efforts in connecting inner city small business with lenders nationwide of Chinwe Onyegoro. For pioneering a new solution, to our growing ocean plastic pollution problem, Adam Lowry. Thousands of tribal farmers to create an international brand of the highest quality and escape poverty, Manoj Kumar. For providing financial services to underbanked areas, building assets, and access to credit for economically distressed Southerners, Bill Bynum. My dad embodied curiosity, intensity, and leadership. But it was the kind of leadership that made others into leaders as well. My dad once said, in what maybe only I consider a famous quote, <laughs> I, he said, I have a confession to make. I am an addict. And I am addicted to talent. With that addiction, he spurred so many people to do many things that they thought that they could not do, and he touched many, many lives, and through this prize, he continues to touch those lives and encourage people to excel. My sister and brother and I are pleased to honor my dad through the McNulty Prize and to invest in young leaders around the world who share the same energy, enthusiasm, and commitment to excellence that he did. Thanks to all of you for your support. I would now like to invite Peter Reiling to the stage, along with four of the winners to the McNulty Prize, Jordan Caslow, Patrick Owua, Dele Elojade, and Amit Bhatia, for a discussion of their experiences. I'm going to call you up one by one. Oh, okay. I'm going to call you up. Okay. Okay. 
So first of all, I'd like to uh, very much thank uh, Ann McNulty and your family. Uh, Johnny, thank you so much. Thank you for creating this prize. Uh, it is such a great motivator for our fellows. Of course, they don't do their work for money, but the recognition that comes from this prize is just a great motivator for all of our fellows to step up and, as we both love to say, to make a dent in the universe. So what I'd like to do now is to call up one by one um, our prior winners. John Danner cannot be with us tonight. Uh, he's busy with his next startup, another education venture. But let me invite the others up there, up here now. So I'll begin with the uh, successful New York optometrist turned vision entrepreneur, Jordan Kesselow, the inaugural winner of the John P. McNulty Prize. I then like to invite the man who, uh, my wife and I spent many years living in Ghana, I spent many years working there. Uh, Patrick Awua and his family had to flee Ghana when Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings took over the country, came to the United States, attended Swarthmore College, uh, went on to Cal Berkeley to get his MBA, went to Microsoft, spent 11 years there, but felt that continual tug to return to his homeland of Ghana, Patrick Awua. Uh, while all the uh, presentations were going up here, I made a quick phone call, and uh, Deli's wife said that I'm actually a better dancer than he is, so <laughs> why don't you dance your way on up here, big shot, come on. <laughs> Africa's only Pulitzer Prize winning and former editor of, the news, of Newsday, uh, Deli Olojede. Give me a little dance here. <laughs> We're not so bad, are we? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the founder and the former head of the McKinsey Knowledge Center 2012 winner of the John P. McNulty Prize, Amit Bhatia. <laughs> Amit, welcome. Thank you. Great. Welcome to all you guys. Great to have you up here. So we want to have a conversation for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, all right? And it's interesting. Here we are. It's hard to believe, Anna, that it's been five years since we began the presentation of these prizes. And we thought this would be a good opportunity to stop and pause and think about what's happened in those five years. Uh, many of our fellows are grappling with their projects, trying to figure out what to do to make them successful. Uh, we all spent time these past few days reading great pieces, one of them was trough, and I think we all know that projects go through their peaks and their troughs, and I wanted to explore that theme a little bit. So first thing I want to do is refresh everybody's memory, and I'd like each of you to speak very succinctly about what was it that motivated you to tackle the particular project that you did. Jordan, you want to start us off? I would love to. Thank you, Peter. My journey started in northern Alaska. I was a mountaineer, I was climbing in the Brooks Range, and I found myself on top of a mountain, a windswept mountain, rain pelting my face, and it was one of those moments where I caught a glimpse of the universe unfolding in front of my eyes. And it was a glimpse that showed me that, in fact, I was just a dust in the wind. And I hated that message. I was 23 years old. I felt that there was more to life than that. I just couldn't accept that message from the universe. And I literally remember screaming back at the universe and saying, I do matter. But to be frank with you, deep in my marrow, I didn't know how. And fast forward six months later, I found myself in Mexico in front of a seven-year-old boy who was blind. And after looking at his eyes, we recognized that, in fact, he wasn't blind. He just needed a very, very strong pair of eyeglasses. And I was the lucky person to put those glasses on his face. And when the lenses aligned with his eyes, this universal smile of joy radiated across his face. And it was another moment where the universe unfolded. But this time, the message, message was different. The message was telling me that I could gain access to that interconnected oneness through action, that I could find my purpose, and that there was a way forward to make a big difference in the world. Great story. Patrick, what motivated you? Uh, my moment was uh, in a hospital room in Seattle uh, when my son was born. 
and uh, looking into his eyes and seeing all of humanity. Uh, this was my moment. And um, in particular, you know, he was born at a time when the news out of Africa was really bad. It was Somalia, Rwanda. And I was thinking, you know, my generation is going to leave a world for the next generation. And what kind of world is it going to be? Um, and it seemed to me that that world needed to be a world where Africa was transformed, was on a different path, was ascending. And, and so the son of this, the, the birth of this boy caused me to think about a whole continent again, which I hadn't done for a long, for a long while. Uh, and, and so I started to think about what to do, thought I would go do software, change my mind to do education for a simple reason that I, I, you know, I sort of thought about what can I contribute given my limited means and what really are the deepest problems. And I did this exercise with friends and family of just taking any problem and asking why is this the way it is? And whatever answers we came up with, I'd ask again why? And for practically every problem, we settled on leadership as, as, a, as a fundamental reason. Um, and leadership is defined by the people in positions of influence um, or authority who are accepting the status quo, um, who are not solving the problems, or who are unethical, just corrupt. Um, and so I thought, if we can change the way the leaders of this continent are educated, then we will change the continent. Um, and I thought I would start with higher ed because, you know, you take, you know, these 18, 20 year olds, uh, if we can give them education so they have compassion, they have integrity, um, and, and they have the ability and the desire to solve problems, then fast forward 20, 30 years when they're the leadership core that a continent changes. And so I thought, if I, if I can be patient enough, if I can take a project that's going to have, uh, you know, effect 20, 30 years forward, then I can make a difference. Um, and not only with the institution that, that I helped set up, but by setting the bar so that other universities on the continent will change. And so if we can change the way the leaders of Africa are educated, I think that we will change the continent and, and we will see this new world. Um, that is so important. And that was the birth of Ashesi University. Yep. Great, thank you. Dele? Well, mine, at least in part, was uh, motivated by um, a desire to escape boredom. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I left Nigeria as a 26-year-old uh, young hotshot journalist uh, crusading against evil. We were going to change the world, wrestle our country down. Uh, and uh, on a Sunday afternoon, they sent a letter bomb to my editor and he was killed. He was also a close friend of mine. This was uh, on October 19, 1986 a Sunday, uh, late morning, about 11 o'clock. Anyway, that triggered a series of events. I issued a press statement accusing the military dictator of being behind the killing. And uh, one thing led to the other, I became prudent to leave. Uh, and so I did. Uh, but the idea was that I was going to take a breather in grad school uh, in New York at Columbia and that I was going to go right back into the flames and we will sort this thing out. Uh, but uh, that also proved to be imprudent at the time. And so I you know, embarked on this career in New York and uh, with luck and uh, with the support of so many other people, I became what you might call quite successful at it. And I was posted all over the world and everywhere from Tibet to uh, Pamung John on the DMZ to Somalia and uh, South Africa and Rwanda and all points in between. And so I'd come back, New York was now home, uh, come back in uh, 1999 
after my posting in Beijing was over and uh, became desk bound as an editor. Uh, of course, in my usual version, I threw um, uh, myself wholeheartedly into this, but uh, it wasn't really me. I like to be out there kicking tires and making a little bit of trouble, and it didn't seem to have gotten any easier with age either. And so, uh, sometime in 2004, I looked up at the clock on the wall and decided I'm going back to that country, Nigeria, and we're going to go and try to do something which I considered the only thing I could reasonably competently do, and which was to create uh, an avenue for public conversation through a news organization that would be uh, immune to uh, the pressures of uh, political and other corruption, and that would make uh, life uh, and the conditions in which Nigerians live very clear to them, so that no one would be able to claim that they didn't know what was going on. And so it was uh, that boredom at my desk job as a editor in New York that was the final trigger. But even then, I was still slightly uh, lacking in courage because I do enjoy the good life and Nigeria is not a place you would uh, uh, call uh, a cushy posting. Uh, um, and so the final impetus for me came as a result of my being invited to be uh, a fellow uh, of the African Leadership Initiative and we gathered here in the spring of 2005. And while getting drunk in the reception there, <laughs> uh, drinking whiskey was Anne Lamont's 40th birthday, as I recall. You, you and I danced then too, I think. And we danced. Uh, we danced the night away. Yes. Denise was not no, uh, she was away. present. Um, and I decided at that moment that uh, I was going to take the plunge. And so I did. Amit. Well, I was just working for the money. So the hundred ten. <laughs> now, uh, you know, my story starts uh, way back in 1947, when pretty much India was born out of a partition with, uh, and uh, my father who was just eight years old then. You know, walked about 75 miles in the middle of riots. About a million plus people died in that partition burnt alive in very savage ways. Our family lost many members. And as an eight-year-old, as he made across the border to Amrish Sarai, he would tell me later you know, in my life how there were no refugee camps, you know, there was no way to treat so many refugees moving over, and he worked as a boy, eight-year-old porter at the railway station to figure out how to get his meals. Over the next several decades, he worked during the day, educated himself at night, and I think most of my growing up years just left two messages with me. One about pretty much love for the country, second about education, the only way you'd empower someone. Fast forward to 2006 as we went through our first seminar and you know, scratching our head, which project, how do you go and uh, make sure you give back. India was coming up 60 years of independence and a statistic that boggled me was that India in the next 15 years was going to add 500 million new job seekers. And thinking of that number, 500 million new job seekers, you know, one and a half times the population of US, got me worried. And I was still the divisional CEO at, at a New York Stock Exchange listed company with 12,000 employees. And in India, I knew we were hiring three people of every 100 we interviewed. So there were people out there in India, but not skilled or talented enough, and so then the calling was clear. If we could not figure out how to use this youth bulge and make it a demographic dividend, something that lurked ahead was a demographic disaster. And I think it was clearly, think, uh, moving into 2007, as India celebrated 60 years of independence, I said, well, if there's something I'm going to do next 15 years, and this 500 million number was a 2007 to 2022 figure when India turned 75. Maybe out of the 500 million people, Aspire can train 1 million of them. So that was my motivation. Mm -hmm.
So those are, those are four amazing stories. Uh, let me ask you a next question, which is um, if you had to single out, again, keeping in mind the fellows out here who are scratching their heads trying to figure out um, how to best construct and, and avoid disasters within their own projects, what would you say is the, if you had to single out the one key thing you learned about making your project successful, what would you say it is? One thing. Yeah. Other than, I, other than, I other than, because we got 11 minutes and 52 yes. seconds. Other than the people, that's a way of getting two in there. Um, <laughs> the one thing that I think um, is most critical, and I think it's the biggest mistake in nonprofit organizations, is spending the requisite time to nail your operational and funding model. And until you have that unit model, that works, don't scale. No matter who throws money at you and tells you where to go, because unless you have that, that's your treasure, and that's what's going to bring you long-term success. So why didn't you tell me about that? Before? Well, you didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have that panel yet. Yeah. So I would, I'll stop there, give him the time. All right. Patrick? Well, I, I would say that, um, you know, the, the reading we did, Omelis, yes. the ones who walk away, uh, is the ones who walk away from, the ones who walk away from Ursula Le Guin. Yep. Yes, Ursula Le Guin. Um, it's a really profound uh, reading. Um, and, you know, Ursula Le Guin had this literary technique where she kept saying, as you like it, she was inviting us to write the story with her. Um, and she ends with this open ended um, question of, we don't know who what happened with these people who walked away from Amelis. But I interpreted that as she was inviting us to continue to write the story. And to write the story, we needed to walk away from Amelis. And I suspect that uh, some of the fellows need to walk away from Amelis. In other words, they need to commit to this new thing that they're doing. And that commitment might come in the form of 